Did he fall from the cliff or was he pushed? And was the occult responsible in any way? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kurt McFall. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Oopsies. That was a new one. Before we get started, hello, my name is Mike. If you're new to the channel, I tell three true crime stories here on YouTube every single week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I also pepper in some YouTube shorts every once in a while. So please subscribe if you're into true crime. You can give this video a like so it gets pushed out to more people. If you're more into short form stories, you can head on over to my TikTok where I'm definitely more known. I have around 3 million followers over there. The link to that is in the link tree, which is in the description of this video below. The link to my TikTok also pops up here at some point in the beginning and also at the end. I do have two TikTok pages right now where I sell true crime stories. So you can do both or pick one. I also sell merch. We have that in the link tree below. We sell like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that. And we do ship all over the entire world. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just email me. My email is listed below. You can just email me the name of the individual, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add it to the list. There are about 5,800 names on there right now. I pick my cases out at random, so it could be a long time before I cover the case you want me to cover, but it will happen at some point. But let us get into today's case. Kurt Thomas McFall was born on December 9th, 1966, and he was born in San Diego, California. By the time this case happens, he is 17 years old and he is living now in Northern California in San Francisco. Kurt was described as a really intelligent and super popular kid at the high school he attended. He was heavily involved in like the yearbook and also worked on the school's newspaper. He was really good with math and he loved science. There were thoughts that came to him that he may want to join the military after he graduated high school. He was a very confident person, very full of energy, and he at times had a very uh, intense personality. His friends, when talking about him, just always have nothing but like amazing things to say. Kurt was also a bit of a nerd. He had recently gotten into the Dungeons and Dragons games. Now, this happens in the 80s, and then, you know, the 80s and 90s were was very heavily involved with Satanic Panic. I've talked about Satanic Panic in several videos before on YouTube and TikTok because it has popped up uh, many times for like potential like motives for crimes or something like that. A year before this case happens, Kurt joins a community called, that's abbreviated SCA, which stands for Society for Creative Anachronism. The whole thing was about this group of people who would dress up in basically medieval type gear, you know, like a knight in shining armor type things. And they would go to a parking lot and they would have these like fake fights with their swords and whatever other weapons that they would bring with them. They practiced like jousting and sword fighting. This is something that not just Kurt, but all of them really had a really, really fun time doing. One of the members of SCA would later be interviewed and said that Kurt was there practicing at least twice a week for, for a while. He was really, really good at doing this jousting and sword fighting. And she said that Kurt was going to be really, really good with the real thing. I guess they do like competitions and stuff. Kurt was very involved. He mingled with the group, you know, a lot, and he got along with everyone. There were no signs of anyone hating him or being jealous of him in this group, nothing like that. At least, nothing that anyone has said publicly. It was September 8th, 1984. It was a Saturday. Kurt McFall left the home that he shared with his father. Kurt got into his vehicle. He drove across the Bay Bridge to go into San Francisco. He apparently had plans to spend the night at a friend's house and he was supposed to come home on that Sunday evening, so like the next day. However, Kurt did not come home. Kurt was reported missing by his dad 
pretty much the, you know that day, but it wouldn't be long before Kurt was found. And this is where it gets very mysterious. Monday, September 10th, 1984, there are two people who are out bird watching. They are near the Land's End Cliffs. And as they're kind of walking along the shore, they see what looks like someone just sort of maybe laying on the beach. Maybe they're getting a tan or whatever. But the closer they get, they realize this person is not, they're not set up for this type of thing. There's no beach towel, there's no chairs. This person had no shirt on, no shoes, and no socks. They were just wearing their pants. They looked kind of filthy, almost covered in some sand kind of, and they weren't moving. They weren't, nothing was going on. And on a closer inspection, these two bird watchers realized that this individual was dead. Police and ambulance arrive, and yes, he is confirmed deceased. And they would soon identify this person as 17-year-old Kurt McFall. Kurt McFall was a very good mountain climber. He was very experienced with it. He was an avid swimmer. He, I think he competed in like swim teams and he was a diver. He knew the water really well. And so when his dad heard about this, with Kurt being at the bottom of this cliff, or possibly washed up in the water, he was just immediately didn't buy it. Like Kurt knows how to, you know, handle himself around cliffs and he knows definitely how to swim. I, he couldn't understand how Kurt got into that situation where he may have fallen. The lifeguard who was there, who kind of approached the scene, said it, it looked as if Kurt had fallen off the cliff. And then there was someone from the Coast Guard who came to the crime scene and they too looked at the, you know, his body and where the cliff was positioning and his, they all basically agreed. It looked like Kurt fell off this cliff. Officially, the coroner would say that Kurt McFall died of injuries that are consistent with falling from a cliff. He had a series of abrasions and scratches and whatnot along his entire back. However, there were no other signs of any kind of trauma. There was no uh, stab wounds, no gunshot wounds. There were no indications that he had been punched or anything, at least in the front. There were some bruising on his back. Could have been someone had hit him with something, but it wasn't very clear. Around the same time, at the top of the cliff, but a little bit farther down, this is near like a, a, a golf course type place, they find Kurt's vehicle and it really wasn't very far from where eventually Kurt would be found. There were some concerns about this as well. Around his car were beer bottles. In his car, they found, I think, one or two beer bottles. They found his driver's license basically just on the floor of the car. According to Kurt's dad, Kurt McFall does not drink at all, but this is a 17-year-old kid and you know, maybe back then in the 80s, his dad maybe didn't want to believe that Kurt drank beer without him knowing, but it's not like it's impossible. However, there were a lot of beer bottles around the car to indicate that this wasn't just one person at his car. Also, something the coroner would state is that Kurt McFall, he, they tested, they did a toxicology report, no alcohol, no drugs in his system. Did they test those beer bottles for fingerprints? As far as I know, they did not. Did they dust his car for fingerprints? As far as I know, I don't think they did. Missing from the trunk of Kurt's vehicle was the, uh, the costume or the gear he had made himself for his SCA competitions. You know, like the, the knight's armor that he was always using. It was missing from his trunk. Was this like some kind of weird robbery that they're just specifically stealing that costume because there was a $20 bill just chilling right there in the car out in the open that nobody took? The police and the Coast Guard, they were very quick to just say this was an accidental death. Kurt fell off a cliff on accident and he died. And that's, that's it, case closed. Well, not to his dad. His dad was far from being done with it. A couple of things. We'll talk about first the phone call that Kurt's dad received from someone close to Kurt. This phone call said that about a week prior to Kurt's death, Kurt told this friend 
that Kurt had now become involved in a satanic cult. This cult was performing magic, black magic. And the members of the satanic cult were essentially trying to control Kurt completely. Kurt told this friend on the phone call, I'm in over my head and I don't know how to get out of this. He told his friend he wanted out, but he didn't know how to do it because maybe he was scared to, I'm not sure. But he did state that he was afraid of some of the members of this cult. Did he name any of them? I, again, I'm not sure. There's no nothing to indicate that he did. But he likely thought that if he tried to leave this cult, he would probably be killed by them. So Kurt's dad was obviously very kind of like taken aback and surprised by this information. He goes into Kurt's room and he notices some things. He has this like little leather bag and he dumps out the contents and there are some strange things in it. There was a knife that was made out of a deer's hoof. Hoof? A deer's hoof? Deer's hoof. A deer hoof. There was this necklace made of stones and feathers. There was also a candle in this bag. There were books of the occult, numerous books of the occult in his room. He found drawings that apparently Kurt did that depicted satanic rituals and other violent type scenes. So Kurt first became very involved with the game Dungeons and Dragons, right? And that's deals with a lot of like medieval type stuff. I think I played Dungeons and Dragons, like the, you know, like where you sit around a table kind of thing. I played that back when I was a teenager. Honestly, kind of fun. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie to you. I nerded out when I was a teenager, kind of liked it. But in the 80s and 90s, Dungeons and Dragons would, would essentially kind of get the blame for a lot of like satanic type things. People were like, oh, they started with Dungeons and Dragons and now they're into satanic occults. Ooh, it's the gateway drug. <laughs> like it's, it's ridiculous now to say that, but that was kind of a thought. That was a thing back then. But he went from Dungeons and Dragons to doing essentially cosplaying as medieval knights, doing sore play and jousting. He was really good at it. He got very involved, but he also became really, he wanted to know more about the medieval life, medieval culture, I guess, you know. This led to Kurt joining yet another group. This was a group that essentially practiced a pagan religion. Now, Kurt's dad was aware of this. He was aware that Kurt had recently joined this group because a friend had called Kurt's dad and told him how he was concerned about Kurt's involvement in this pagan group. And Kurt was really becoming involved in it and he was really accepting it into his life. And this would cause him to alienate a bunch of people in his life, you know, mainly his friends. Kurt's, I guess, teacher or instructor in this particular group was a man named Gabriel Carrillo. He would go by this ancient Welsh name, refer to himself as Karadok or Karadok. Karadok. Gabriel had actually met Kurt, in, you know, individually. And when Kurt kind of was talking about how he was really into like the medieval stuff and magic and stuff like that, that's when Karadok invited Kurt into this group. The friend of Kurt's who told dad, his dad about this group, that, that friend said he was really concerned because the way he depicted Kurt's involvement in this group was like an addiction. That essentially at first he could do all this stuff and take it in and, and he would be fine. He would know when to stop or when to like back away. But then he became hooked on it. And then it got to a point where he couldn't leave it. Is this the satanic group that was then later referenced? I'm not sure uh, if maybe the person who said that about Kurt being involved in a satanic cult, if Kurt was referring to this group or if he did something beyond that, because this Karadok or Karadok person would say that there was nothing involved with Satanism or satanic cults or anything like that in this group. As a matter of fact, he would say he despised that kind of thing. Is it possible that Kurt branched away from this pagan group and joined a satanic cult? Well, 
the evidence that was found in his room and the phone call from the friend, it, it does sound like that's a possibility. However, there is no actual proof of that and they don't, they've never found this potential other group, this satanic group of people. But now there is this belief that Kurt was afraid for his life because he maybe wanted to leave this satanic group that he had gotten in too deep with all of this and he didn't know how to leave it. And maybe one night he finally said, okay, I'm done. And maybe they killed him for it because they didn't want people knowing about them. And to be fair, he died and, and without sharing who exactly they were. Only He only ever told people that there was a group. He didn't name anyone to my knowledge. So it's unknown. And then it was discovered that the friend that Kurt McFall was going to spend the night with that particular evening, the night he would have probably disappeared, was none other than Gabriel Carrillo, a.k.a. Karadak. According to Gabriel, I'm going to call him Gabriel, <laughs> he said that the two of them planned to go to dinner and watch a movie, and they did that, and then Kurt had gone to go lay down to go to bed, and then Gabriel went to his room and went to bed. Gabriel says that at around 3 o'clock in the morning, Kurt got up and he started knocking on Gabriel's bedroom door saying, hey, it's really hot in here. I'm going to go to the beach at three o'clock in the morning. And so Kurt left the house and that was the last time anyone could report seeing Kurt alive. Now, I think people, there were people who did suspect that Gabriel had something to do with this, but... I want to reiterate that there was actually no proof of that. There was no evidence to show that this guy had anything to do with Kurt's death. I don't know how thoroughly they looked into him or how they kind of came to the conclusion that he probably had nothing to do with it. But, but then that's where, and I want to stress this next part as being rumors and hearsay and there's no proof of this. But the more you read about this, that whole situation being involved with, you know, Gabriel would lead to the rumors of, was Kurt McFall possibly gay? There were a lot of things here and there, speculation or rumors that Kurt may have been gay. And that led to another possibility that was Kurt possibly outed and was he killed by a group of people who gay bashed him, who basically hate crimed him to death by maybe forcing him to walk off the cliff or pushing him off the cliff. That's uh, that's just sort of out there. It's not, the police haven't really investigated really any lead to be honest with you, but th that's something that was not really ever touched on at all. But what we ultimately have is we have a 17 year old kid who was seemingly happy with life but also apparently afraid of this mysterious group. He probably wanted to get out of that group, and then he is found dead at the bottom of a cliff. I guess my my confusion comes in from like, this was at three o'clock in the morning, according, if you believe Gabriel's story. This was around three o'clock in the morning. Was the satanic group following him and just got lucky by seeing him leave this place on his own? If this was, if, you know, Kurt was gay and this was like a gay bashing thing, how did they know? And also, how do they know he would be out at that time of day? That's, that's the problem with this case is there's just such this blanket of vague information. It's, there's no, there's very little concrete proof or evidence of any of it. They have no idea. They can't say for, with certainty, how Kurt got to the bottom of that cliff. They don't know if he did it to himself on purpose, if he accidentally fell, or if he was murdered. The coroner initially said, I believe this to be a homicide just based on the circumstances, but the police investigated and said, no, this was, he just accidentally fell off the cliff. To me, I think this was a case that's really hard to investigate, to be fair, that there was so much hearsay about the satanic cult and things they, they can't 
prove or have any tangible evidence of, there really wasn't much to look at or find because no one from that group is going to talk if that group is real. And so what are, like, what can police do? Kurt's dad firmly believes that Kurt was murdered. And to be honest with you, my gut instinct says I agree with him. My gut instinct tells me that someone pushed him off that cliff. But I, I just, I don't know who. That's, you know, I don't, I have no inkling as to who could have done that. But when seeing his story of who he was, the things he did, the, how happy he was, it, it just, it just doesn't make sense that he would just walk so precariously next to a cliff and fall off of it. Especially with no alcohol or drugs in his system, he wasn't drunk, so he wasn't impaired. Who was drinking all those beer bottles around his car? Why didn't they take fingerprints if they, if they didn't? Why didn't they dust for fingerprints in the car if they didn't? I don't know if they did or not. Did they thoroughly investigate that vehicle? I, it's vague. I don't know. And that's essentially where this case ends with, I don't know. They don't know. Nobody knows. His death is basically ruled undetermined. They know how he died. They know what physically made him die. They just don't know how he got there. And this is a case where unless somebody comes forward and says, this is, you know, this is what happened. I have proof of this. I don't think they're going to come to a conclusion here because they're, they won't, there's no physical evidence, none. They got nothing. So they have to rely on someone out there coming forward. This is, God, I was born in 85. This is what, 40 years ago, 40 years ago. So if the, you know, the person, if someone did push him off that cliff, that person's still alive. Absolutely. Maybe in their 50s or 60s. Gabriel Carrillo Karadak passed away on January 1st, 2007. He was 58 years old. And again, there was no proof or anything to indicate he had any involvement in this crime. There's no proof of anyone. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth if this was a homicide. And that person might be you. So, if you have information about the death of Kurt McFall, please contact the San Francisco Police Department at 415-553-0123. You can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Kurt McFall was a 17-year-old kid with a lot going on. He was having fun with life. He probably had a very bright future ahead of him. But on one night in 1984, he somehow ended up at the bottom of a cliff. And nobody knows how or why. If this was murder, then Kurt McFall deserves justice. So please help him get the justice he rightfully deserves. But... That is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe if you are into true crime. Give this video a like so more people can see it. Follow me over on TikTok. The link is in the description up here. And baba ding, baba ding, baba. Check out the merch store. I uh, recommend a case to my email address. And that's it. That's it. That's my talent. That's my talent. Um, this is the talent episode. I'm going to show you my talents to say goodbye. This is one of them. Mm -hmm. What was that? What was that song? I heard it in my head. Did you hear it? I don't know if I heard it, but you heard it. I heard it. Did you hear it? You heard it. I heard it. <clears throat> my other talent is I can take a Mountain Dew can and I can shove it all the way in my mouth. So... <laughs> See? Wow. <laughs> uh, God, I'm good at things in my mouth. Oh, Jesus, Mike, that's a that's a talent, I guess. Um, where am I going? The talent. That's can I go to America's Got Talent with that? Howie, Howie Mandel, you out there? You follow me on TikTok, Howie. So, is that a talent? Is that a talent worthy of being on your program? 
and earning a million dollars in a swallowing a Mountain Dew can. This is so uncomfortable. No, you say goodbye. <laughs> He's silly. Oh, you did. You're gone. Oh, okay. You were gone a while ago. That's fine. I'm just here talking to myself. <laughs> anyway. Mm-hmm. Vista pasta. Fuck. Nope.